Hello everyone. Welcome to this session on computer vision system design. My name is Mandar Gujarati and I'm applications engineer with MathWorks. Today's talk we are going to focus on deep learning and 3D vision. Before we just jump into the specifics of this talk, let's try to understand why computer vision is so important today. Now, before the start of this conference, I did some searches on the internet to understand how the computer vision market is progressing. And I was amazed with what I found. I found links related to Intel acquiring computer vision market for IoT and automotive. Links related to predicting where the computer vision market or how the computer vision market is going to grow. It's going to reach to 50 billion by 2022 or so. I found links related to autonomous cars, deep learning. How these said, and on that link, there's a, there's a, it's a, it's actually a blog. So in that blog, it has been written that it's very easy to design these self-driving cars, which are 99% accurate. It's very, very difficult to increase that accuracy to 99.999%. And that's very neat, necessary because when you're traveling at a speed of 100 miles an hour, 100 kilometers an hour, you just can't afford to make any mistakes. Mistakes are going to get disastrous then. So for those purposes, you know, computer vision is and deep learning um, go hand in hand. So if you want to design something for collision avoidance, or driver assistance systems. That's where deep learning and computer vision is important. So let's focus our agenda on these two topics, 3D or stereo vision and deep learning. So let's start with stereo vision. What is stereo vision? The stereo vision is the process of extracting 3D information from multiple 2D views of a scene. And in a while though, I've got with me two cameras, uh, which are trying to get multiple views of a, 2D, of a 2D scene. So I've got two cameras with me. I'll be showing you that in a minute. So stereo vision, is there any MATLAB product which will help me do that? Yes, there is. And the computer vision system toolbox just has those uh, capabilities to do the 3D point cloud. <clears throat> and this point cloud application is heavily used in ADAS systems, collision avoidance, collision detection, um, odometry. If you want to, if you're surveying a geographical uh, region, you want to understand um, the area of the geographical region. Is it possible through odometry and point cloud application? This is. There's over here in this particular slide, I've also introduced a link to a MathWorks ebook on ADAS. And that ebook talks about the different challenges and how MathWorks can help you overcome those. So, this particular ebook is giving you an overview, um, some examples, some videos, and how, uh, and some quotes from these famous companies of how they have used uh, MathWorks works products in their specific application. Okay. So what is Studio Vision? So we having seen what Studio Vision is, how can MATLAB help me get those 3D information from multiple views of a 2D scene? So over here in this particular slide, I have introduced a workflow. So we are just using regular cameras. I've got two Logitech cameras with me. And to start with studio vision, the very first step is to calibrate the camera. Now, if your cameras have already been calibrated, you can totally skip that step. So, but let's see what, how MATLAB can help you calibrate the cameras. And once you calibrate those cameras, you need to get some parameters, how one camera is looking at a particular object with respect to the other. So those parameters need to be extracted. And once you extract those parameters, once the camera is calibrated, start the live acquisition of the scene, apply those parameters to the to this scene and um, to rectify for any errors. So that's the second step. 
if you want to uh, go for going towards stereo vision. Once you uh, distort or undistort those images by applying those parameters, you want to calculate something called as a disparity map or the pixel differences. Okay, so how what's the difference between the views of those cameras to a specific object? That's the disparity map. And once you have the disparity map, you need to put everything together to design this 3D point cloud. Over here in this particular slide, you could also see these function names, rectify stereo images, disparity map, PC show, and, and so on. So these function names are a part of the um, computer vision system toolbox. However, I haven't given any name of a function to the first part, the first step, this, which is a camera calibration. There's a reason for that. Okay, and we'll see what that reason is. Camera calibration, um, need to estimate the parameters of a video camera for various reasons. You may want to um, remove some lens distortion. You may want to estimate the 3D structure. You may want to estimate depth or you may want to measure some objects. And on the right hand side over here on the slide, I have given the workflow of camera calibration. So prepare images, add those images. Once the images are added, calibrate them evaluate for their accuracy if the accuracy is not sufficient improve the accuracy and once the accuracy is sufficient to your needs you can export the parameters now what is this with respect to where to add those images how to calibrate the camera so we'll, let's have a look into all those things so that's the setup i have i have got um, two cameras logitech cameras mounted on a on a uh, on a post <clears throat> and i've got the checkerboard with me and the checkerboard is a great tool for calibration both of these cameras are connected to the computer the usb through a usb cable so they are connected to the computer so that i can use them i can use matlab to control them okay so once these um, cameras are tied to my computers through the USB uh, cables, let's try to fire them and let's try to acquire some images. Okay, so over here I'm into my uh, folder. I'm going to start with acquiring images for calibration. So take calibration images. How can I start these cameras and how can I start acquiring these images? So over here, I've got two webcams, the left and the right one. I'm just initializing them. Um, so iMac.video device is, um, this is the image acquisition toolbox function. And then I'm just setting some parameters. How do I want to acquire those images? I want to acquire them in unsigned integer A data type and so on. So that's the setup. And once it has been set, now what this is called is the system object. So this is just setting up the cameras. And once you want to use the system object, all you'll be doing is making use of the step function. So left cam and right cam. So if you want to start, fire up the left cam and right cam, all I'm doing is using the step function. And once this step, step function is used, I'm uh, taking 50 such images and I'm writing these images to the respective folder. So left, images from the left cam are written in the left folder. Images from the right cam are written into the right folder. So I won't be um, taking images now. I've already done that. I have uh, ran that script and I've got 50 images in the left folder. And I've got 50 such images on the in the right folder. Now, let's try to see how can we calibrate the camera, how can we obtain those parameters. Now, for calibration purposes, you need to visit the Apps tab. In the Apps tab, you have, if you go under Image Processing and Computer Vision, you see those two camera calibrator apps. The one with the camera calibrator um, that particular app is for single camera calibration. 
we've got two cameras with us so we'll be making use of the stereo camera calibration app so let's fire that up and over here the first step is to add those images so i'm going to click on add images images from the right folder and images from the left folder so select and the checkerboard size is about 33 and a half millimeters so you need to measure the set checkerboard size and put those images inside that app okay it is populating those images and these images will appear on the left hand side over here in the data browser pane so once um, it, all these images are there um, hit calibrate now if you want to get out of any tangential distortion you make sure you need to check this box but at the moment I'll just keep it simple and I'll hit calibrate so it's trying to cal calibrate both the cameras and in the meantime it will just give us some statistics so it's giving some uh, measurements, what's called as the extrinsic and the errors. So extrinsic camera centric or pattern centric view, how the cameras are seeing the pattern or vice versa. And the reprojection errors, whether it has properly found those checkerboard squares. You can play with those errors over here. You can um, play with the threshold and minimize, try to minimize those errors until uh, they are appreciable to you, are they acceptable to you? So I'm just setting up that uh, threshold value to sub somewhere about 0.22 and once I move that threshold line, I'm just hitting delete. So which means so some of some of these images are selected over here at the left. So you want to remove them because they're having some high errors and you want to recalibrate the camera. And that's the reason why that's the same purpose. That's the reason why I have taken 50 such images so that, you know, my ca camera calibration pattern or my camera calib cameras are calibrated in a better way. You can, we can move that even further if you want to just minimize even further. You can play with the threshold, see whatever threshold level is acceptable to you, hit delete and recalibrate the cameras. So it's up to you. Once you're done, once you're happy with the um, errors, um, error rates, you can export the camera parameters. Now, in that particular um, uh, green check mark, you can export the camera pa parameters as a variable or you can also generate the code so for now let's try to export those camera parameters as a variable okay so once that's done these variables will now be available in the workspace so these are the errors and the camera parameters calibration parameters which we want to use in the next step all right so let's try to summarize what we have just seen. Um, there are different kinds of apps which are available if you're playing with single camera. You can play with the camera calibrator app or if you're having multiple views of the same scene, you can choose to work with the stereo camera calibrator app. Uh, play, uh, work with the threshold, um, find up an acceptable level of interest, uh, error level of interest. And then once you have acquired that, export the parameters onto the workspace. So the advantage of Camera Calibration App is a simplified workflow. It, it also removes the effects of lens distortion, tangential distortion if you want to uh, work with. You can even select that particular check um, checkbox. Uh, automatically detects the checkerboard pr patterns, projects on them, and also with the error levels, you can help improve uh, the accuracy as well. Now, for now, we have generated the um, variables which are available on the workspace you can also generate the code it is just the second option which is present over here so you can also generate a matlab script okay as uh, for some more information um you, you can also um, remove the radial distortion uh, and the tangential distortion as what in this example it is seen could see in the upper picture that the table is a little bit curved. In the lower picture, after removing the distortion, the table appears straight. You can also measure the sizes of the objects. Uh, so in this case, if you want to identify what's the diameter of these two pennies, 
um, this is possible as well now if those for those who are interested I've introduced um, a shipping example comes with the product measuring planar objects example if you just type if you just copy paste this particular uh, show demo line onto your MATLAB command window that particular example will open up and then you should see it in action all right so we are through with the first step and now we want to move towards the next step the next step is now we want to start acquiring images live and once these images are starting uh, once we are acquiring these images live you're applying these parameters to do some image rectification uh, get rid of the distortion and once the distortion is got rid of you need to compute the pixel differences how the two cameras are seeing it in an object with respect to each other is there any difference and then put everything together to create this 3d point cloud so a couple of functions over here rectify stereo images disparity map pc show and so on so let's have a look of how this could be done. Okay, I already have the parameters in the workspace and I'm trying to apply them to a script. So I'm just running a script, reconstruct iMac live. Now what this is going to do is going to um, get multiple views from the camera of the same scene and construct a 3D point cloud. So I've got a blackboard or a whiteboard beside me and what you see over here, these are the pins. So which have been you know, stuck with a magnet on that whiteboard. I'm just moving in front of the camera now. So that's me. And you could see that it's able to also identify distance. So what you see on the Z axis, that is the distance in meters. So I am just moving back and forth. Maybe I just uh, sit on this chair and you're able to see me there. So that's, it's a multiple views of the same scene and MATLAB is able to construct a 3D picture of myself. And the depth information is also there. So how far I am sitting from that camera. Now I can't go beyond that because there's a wall behind me. So that's what a restriction I have, but that's how things could be done. So I'm just moving out of the scene and I'm coming back to my seat. Okay, so let's have a look of how this could be achieved. Let's have a look at the code. Let's see how those functions which I introduced to you can be applied. So I'm just opening that script now. <clears throat> okay, that's the reconstruction script. I'm pretty much sure you should be aware by now what the first section is doing. Just setting up those two cameras and setting a few of its properties. Over here, it's trying to see whether the variables are available in the workspace. If not, it's going to um, load them. I'm setting the depth to be five meters. This applying these um, step functions to start the cameras, acquire those images. I'm applying those um, stereo parameters, um, which I got from the calibration um, calibration um, app, rectifying just one function to rectify those stereo images one function to compute the disparity map the output of uh, rectify stereo images is the input to the disparity map and once the disparity map is done you can reconstruct the scene using the reconstruct scene function which you get the point cloud and this particular variable goes into the pc show where you can display the point cloud so all we did so and what is coming up next is just a visualization so I'm just adjusting the visualization setting the limits and so on and so forth so just simple steps the first section you need to um, set up the cameras fire the cameras and that's how three functions rectify stereo images disparity map all right for uh, reconstruct the scene to get the point cloud and PC show to display the point cloud. 
Okay. So that's what we do. Uh, that's what we did. Uh, that's how those are the four steps um, and the associated functions, how you can tie them together to construct the 3D object from multiple views of a 2D scene. And point clouds can also be applied to robot vision. So one such example is uh, this particular video. So there was, uh, what we did, this was done on in our MathWorks uh, kitchen. Um, a robot is traveling with a camera uh, fixed on its head. And as it's traveling, it's trying to reconstruct the scene on its right. So you could see that if, it's, if there is any danger of collision, it's also sensing that it's able to change the path. It's coming towards the doors. As it goes near there, it's able to change the path. Now you see over here how the scene ha is getting reconstructed. Similarly, as it goes near the chair, it's able to change the path. So as it as it's Moving through that region, the scene is also getting reconstructed. So this is one of one of the examples how 3D vision can be applied for point uh, for ADAS systems as well. <clears throat> okay, so having seen stereo vision, let's go to the next part of our talk, and that's about deep learning. Now, before we just we jump into the deep learning concepts, let's try to play a game. And in this game, there is only one rule. You have to be honest. Okay. So the question is, at what age does a person start to recognize the difference between a car or a plane? Maybe some of you must have guessed, maybe two years, three years car or SUV takes a while eight to ten years maybe Toyota or a Mazda it takes even longer so a human being it takes he a human being takes longer to recognize it takes so long to recognize the differences between the two objects so if we were to come up with some kind of a surveillance system. Say, for example, we've got parking bays for cars and SUVs. This, if you want to just come up with a surveillance system with human not in the loop, if you want to just build a machine, you can't just wait as long as a human, say 10 years to recognize the difference between car or SUV to make sure that appropriate bays are full. No. You, have, you want to get something um, quicker. And to get something quicker, that machine needs to learn, learn faster, learn all types of cars, identify all types of cars, identify all types of SUVs, so on and so forth. So with this in mind, uh, here's something which we have uh, built to identify the objects. It's a deep learning system. It has taken into account different types of objects, namely uh, computer keyboards, uh, iPods, iPads, mouse, and so on. And with this in mind, when it's trying to, it's presented with a live webcam, uh, when the video is getting acquired live, it is doing some detection. And most of the times, as you have seen, this detection is correct. Alternatively, this is another one where a live surveillance system is being built. What type of vehicle is entering in MathWorks uh, premises? Maybe a car or an SUV and so on and so forth. So what happens in this case, um, it feels like, okay, it has identified that as an SUV and so on. So object detection, surveillance, Deep learning is everywhere. It's for computer vision, for pedestrian and traffic sign detection, medical diagnosis, surveillance, landmark identification, fraud detection, for speech recognition and text recognition, even robotics and controls. So there are many areas where deep learning can be applicable, can be useful. 
So while we are on this um, deep learning topic, let's try to answer a few WH questions. What is deep learning? Why deep learning? How to do deep learning? Now we have seen uh, machine learning uh, techniques or data analytics and machine learning uh, seminar a few seminars ago. And what we have seen over there is for machine learning, if you're playing with images, what we did is we we extract these features and we push these features through that classification learner app, which then builds a network for classification purposes. Now, while doing these feature extraction, this is all manual. Manual in the sense, we need to understand, we need to select which particular feature extraction algorithm is required. And it's not that we don't have these feature recognition uh, extraction algorithms. These are present. And most of these algorithms for feature extraction, feature detection, um, they start with the word detect. So detect serve, detect MACR, and all those things. They're all a part of computer vision system toolbox. So these particular functionalities are available. Now, so you have to manually go through the process, um, acquire an image, uh, extract the features, uh, identify a classification term, and then push to the classification on an app so that a machine is being built. However, deep learning, is some is called as end-to-end -end learning. You you're giving there it a bunch of images, and that particular uh, deep learning approach is is like it comes up with so, with its own filters, acquires uh, comes up with its own filters to detect some features, to extract some features. The number of feature learning stages possible in a uh, deep learning network, which is popularly called as a convolutional neural network. Once these features are extracted, they are then uh, presented to the classification stage and for the which the classifier is built. So this manual approach is not there in, it's in the deep learning. The so deep learning is end-to-end -end learning. It decides on the filters to use. So why is deep learning so popular? Now, deep learning is vigorous training. So you you're training for most of the cases. So if you were to do a deep learning algorithm for surveillance or for um, identification purposes, car or SUV identification purposes, you need to take into account all the different models of cars, all the different models of SUVs. And if you want to go do some, identify some other vehicles, you need to take those different models of those vehicles as well. In, in which means you have to uh, work with a number of images. So for this, we need to play with large amounts of data. And if you want to play with large amounts of data, where can you have that data? Where is this data present? In today's world, there are lots of data storage uh, facilities which you can connect to. You can connect to a lot many data databases and you can download such labeled data which you can use for training your deep learning network. Now while you're playing with lots and lots of data, I mean there are also resources which you can use for training. Computing power. We've got a lot of, um, we have a lot of these fancy computers with multi-core, multi-processor technologies or even GPU cards. We have access to clusters where you can use these facilities, you can use these resources to build this deep learning um, model. And because of all these things, because the availability of data, because of uh, computing power available to us, the results which are being achieved now are substantially better. And as you can see, there's some estimates which are placed over here. Pre-2012, the error rate was greater than 25%. And that has substantially come down over the last few years. Since 2015, it was less than 5%. And it's getting better and better. So because of all these resources, because of all this data, uh, all these data sets um, which are there, it is very easy to get the data sets. It is very easy to work with such data sets. And it is now becoming more and more uh, accomplishable that you can get, you're getting better results. So deep learning is gaining, uh, is becoming popular. It's, deep learning can also be seen as an evolution of machine learning.
So, how to build a deep learning network? Can MATLAB, does MATLAB has these uh, functionalities to build these deep learning network? So, in the surveillance uh, video which you just saw, which you just saw, uh, which was um, identifying whether it's a car or an SUV, the different steps which were taken into account. If you're given a video, the first step was working on each frame. So, from the video, apply an algorithm to extract the frame. The frame may be clear, may not be clear. You might want to do some pre-processing on the frame, something like uh, you might want to uh, do resizing, contrast enhancements, and so on and so forth. So once you have that data, you want to extract frames, you want to um, do some pre-processing, say resizing or data augmentation. Once you're through with this pre-processing, you need to push those images, labeled images or frames through a network. You need to uh, you need to know a background in the neural networks or the deep learning. And once you have you have, you have you have built your architecture for the deep learning network, you need to push that data through that network for training and classification. Now, because you're playing with large data sets, you may want to require, you may, you're compelled to use some, um, some resource which can do the computationally, which can do these tasks which are computationally expensive. Something like the GPU or a high power machine. And you need to repeat these processes again and again, so you need, that needs to be iterative. So whatever you build, whatever you work with, it has to be iterative. So there are different challenges in deep learning for computer vision. So let's see how we can overcome these challenges. So does MATLAB do deep learning? Yes, it does. And the deep learning functionalities are now a part of the neural network toolbox. Inside the neural network toolbox, uh, you can search for deep learning and you're given two matches how to build or how to build the convolutional neural network for your own architecture and also you can work with encoders. Okay. So that's just a brief, uh, that's a brief theoretical slide of what um, convolutional neural networks mean or CNN. Um, you've given an image, uh, you have a bunch of images, you, the, it comprises that convolutional neural network typically comprises of two stages. The first stage is a feature learning stage and the second stage is a classification stage. In the feature learning stage, the network needs to come up with different types of filters which do the convolution operation. And that's the reason why it's called as a convolutional neural network. In this convolution, loop, there are multiple filters which have been uh, taken into consideration and all these filters come up with different features. They extract different features from these images. And typically in the feature learning stage, it has got different sub-stages. In a theoretical sense, it's some, it could be convolution stage, a ReLU stage, pooling stage, and so on and so forth. So at this, uh, in this particular slide, there I have just shown two such sub-stages, but there could be many, many more. And once the network is through with its feature learning stage, it goes, it goes to the next stage, that is the classification stage. In the classification stage, all these features are put together in some matrix form, some array form, uh, such that, and the classif and the label is also available. So in the classification stage, a number of different sub-stages like the flattened stage, fully connected stage, softmax stage, as they are known in the theoretical sense. How can this be, this be helpful? Well, the neural network toolbox with the deep learning, it has got functionalities that tie easily to the theoretical definition. You got functions to do the convolutional 2D layer, ReLU layer, max pooling layer. You've got to, you can build the softmax layer, classification layer, fully connected layer, and so on and so forth. So you've got range of functionalities to construct the architecture. That's the deep learning architecture. You've got a range of functions to train the deep learning network. And once the deep learning is deep learning network is trained, you have functionalities to predict the outcome. You can use the network for prediction or classification. Then this is all uh, present in uh, the neural network toolbox now. Okay.
having introduced you to the deep learning um, network or the convolutional neural network, what are the approaches for deep learning? Or how can you build a deep learning network in MATLAB? Or how can you make use of all these functionalities which have just been shown to you? The two approaches, the first approach is to build the deep neural network from scratch. You get in lots of images, maybe you can connect to a database, get in those labeled images, push these labeled images through the convolutional neural network, use those functionalities which have been introduced in the convolutional neural network toolbox or the neural network toolbox, and then you can design your own architecture and then um, use that network for classification or prediction. Now, obviously, you're starting from scratch, so the first this particular approach is going to take time. You can go for a second approach where you can take a pre-trained model and fine-tune a pre-trained model for your data. Right? So this could be something like performing net surgery. So a particular pre-trained network could be um, trained to recognize 20 such classes you want to trim that down to recognize only three or four such classes. So you can fine tune that particular network and because it's already been done, you are saving some time over here. So let's try to see the first approach. The first approach trained the deep neural network from scratch. Now, this is only recommended when you've got lots and lots of labeled images. Also, you want to, because you're playing with lots of images, you need to make sure that you have got access to a GPU because you'll be all, you'll be offloading the computations to the GPU. Now, because you're dealing uh, the network from scratch, training the network from scratch, it will take some amount of training time and typically days to weeks, but definitely for um, lots and lots of images, uh, it'll take days to weeks, but definitely not as long as what we took as a human being to understand the difference between car and SUV, not eight or 10 years. And because you're dealing uh, from scratch, you're constructing from scratch, the model accuracy in this case is high. So based on that, that's that's our first demo, classifying the CIFAR 10 data set. Now over here, I have um, extracted, I've got these uh, images from a website. And those images are, are available for 10 different classes, maybe aeroplane, automobile, the different animals, or even a ship or a truck. So there are different 10 classes available. So our job is to design this convolutional neural network, construct this architecture, push these images through that architecture, train the network, and then use the network for classification on a test set. Okay, so we'll be importing the data, defining the architecture, train and test the convolutional neural network, deep neural network. Now, because I don't have um, a, a GPU a card on my machine, I won't be able to run it. So what I'm doing over here, I'm presenting you a video for that same CIFAR 10 data set. Now over here in the first section, you'll check whether the data set is present inside your computer. If it's not, MATLAB can also connect to that particular website to download that particular data set. Now, when that particular data set is downloaded, it will be present in different folders, a folder of images for automobile, a folder of images for deer, a folder of images for ship, and so on and so forth. Now, you want to access those images, so you want to go for the recursive fashion. So, you'll be making use of image set. Image set is pretty much used when you're playing with large data set, large image data set. And then the recursive form, after you finish playing with images in the first folder, go to the second one, and so on and so forth. So, that's what it is doing over here, accessing those images. And then in the next set, I'm just uh, displaying a sample of image data, maybe 10. I want to just check how it looks like. Right, so this is just a sample. This is some one touch of those images. Once that is done, I'm then moving forward to um, load the training data. Now, with those images I had, I've already divided into a training set and a testing set, and it's present in the respective mat file. So I'm just loading in the training data set. And what's coming up next is the approach or is the construction of the architecture. 
So over here, if I just go back, you could see that I'm trying to construct define a CNN architecture with convolution 2D layer, fully connected layer. And after each thing, I'm just trying to move those variables under the GPU because the computations will be taken on the GPU. I'm defining the layers, average pooling layer, ReLU layer, classification layer, putting all those um, uh, settings. And once the network is defined, I'm using the train network function to train the data set. And then it spits out some results, how long it has taken to train. Typically, um, it's taken about 5,000 iterations to come up with some results. Once I'm done with that, I'm just wanting to see how the layer, how the first layer weights look like. And this is just an image plot of the first layer weight. Once that is done, I'm trying to load the test data set. So I'm just making a few changes over here. Uh, I'm just trying to get rid of those comments and load the test data file. So I've got the test data.mat file. I'm just loading it that. And once that test data file is loaded, I want to use the network which I had just built and trained for classification purposes. And it also spits up some accuracy. I want to check what the accuracy is. Uh, over here, the accuracy is about 75%. But if you had some more layers, added some more, uh, if you had an extensive architecture, you can again play with this accuracy as you need. Okay, having seen how to construct this deep learning network, the second approach over here we have is how to um, use an existing deep learning network and fine tune it. Now, especially when you have uh, lots and lots of data and you have uh, very little time to construct that network, you can use an existing network from a website and do some net surgery on it and use that network for your application for your data set. So especially use when the train data set is small, moderate amount of computation is required, training time is very quick and model accuracy is good because you're using already pre-trained network and you're changing a little bit in it. Now, where can I get these pre-trained models? There's a website called as MatConvNet. So we can just visit that website. And over here in that MatConvNet, there is a section for pre-trained models, pre-trained models in MATLAB. So you've got pre-trained models for face recognition, semantic segmentation, image net classification, and so on and so forth. So one such uh, model has been used in our next demonstration, and that is called as AlexNet. So over here, you have, we've used some existing pre-trained model, AlexNet, from that particular website, MatConnet, pushing in our data set, um, tuning, that, our, tuning that existing model and, and using that for classification. Now, in the interest of time, we won't be unfortunately going through how this um, model works, but there is a video over here in place. If you were to um, look into it, so, we are loading in the network, then we're performing some net surgery, adding in some models, uh, adding some extra layers, and then we are using that network for classification purposes. So I'll, you'll be having a look, you'll be getting these slides and have a look at that particular video and see how things could be altered to suit to your data set. So the challenges which we saw, managing large sets of labeled data, let's have a look at um, how can we address these challenges. So image net or image, uh, image set or image data store is that particular functionality available if you want to handle a large set of images. If you want to resize or do some pre-processing on your images, there are supporting functions, part of the image processing toolbox. Functions like IM resize, IM croc, IM adjust, and so on, they could be useful if you want to um, do some pre-processing. Do you want to have a, if you, if you have a background in neural networks and if you can, want to construct your own deep learning network, well, we've got this uh, neural network toolbox. It has got all these uh, functionalities which are best suited if you want to have your own deep learning network to be constructed. At the moment, all these uh, functionalities which we have seen, um, the training needs to be um, is supported on GPUs and as, uh, as um, there's this function GPU array which can help you translate the variables from your uh, own MATLAB uh, to the GPU. 
So, and no, there's no GPU expertise required for this. And of course, uh, because it's MATLAB, MATLAB could be iterative. You can automate the process. You can offload the computation to a cluster, or even you can test multiple architectures. The functionalities which are required for these things are available in various toolboxes. Um, if you want to offload your computations, you can make use of these uh, palette computing toolbox or MDC and or MDCS. So um, the range of functionalities we have seen, uh, especially for 3D vision and camera calibration and deep learning, uh, we have got the functionalities which could cater you to explore what deep learning is like, come up with your own ideas, construct your own deep learning network, and check the accuracy. We saw two types of uh, problems, two types of approaches for deep learning. The first approach is to um, create a network or construct a deep learning network from scratch. Alternatively, if you don't have time, you can just um, have a pre-trained network and fine tune it. Um, and also, uh, lastly, uh, make sure that you're availing these functionalities of MATLAB um, in the area of deep learning and 3D vision. I'm happy to ad address if you have any questions, um, if you require any clarifications, have any questions or queries, feel free to email me. My email address is mandar.gujarati at mathworks.com.au. Finally, I leave you with some further resources uh, based on this deep learning toolbox, which is available on our file exchange. Make sure you visit those and if, of, if it's of interest, you can even download that. I hope you have uh, liked the uh, the session. Uh, feel free to get in touch with me, or if you have any questions, write to me. I'll be more than happy to assist you. Thank you very much.